Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Using Cisco StealthWatch to Increase Security by Enhancing Critical Security Control Performance, sponsored by Cisco. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Jameson Budacki, Senior Information Security Architect at Erie Insurance, and John Pescatori, Director of Emerging Security Trends at SANS. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface. We will be answering them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to John. Thanks, Carol, and welcome, everyone. Hope you're in some part of the country or the world that has uh, more stable weather conditions than we do here in the East Coast, where it was 70 plus degrees tomorrow and or yesterday, and tonight we're looking at freezing rain and snow. So definitely uh, starting the new year off in a uh, lots of highs and lows here. Um, and that's part of the goal of the SANS What Works program is to take the highs and lows out of uh, life in the security world. Uh, the What Works program is one of the more fun things I do since uh, joining SANS. They're essentially um, vendors uh, find users of their products who are willing to be interviewed by me and we go through sort of a structured discussion finding out what uh, problems spurred rolling out a new security control or process and what lessons learned the user had and what they do differently and um, today we're going to be talking with Jameson Budaki from Erie Insurance and hear about his experience selecting and deploying the uh, Cisco StealthWatch product. So let me give you a little idea about uh, what we're going to do here, a little flow. I'll start off doing a sort of an overview, uh, a little bit of data from last year's uh, security incidents and then sort of drilling down in the areas of why visibility is important and um, sort of narrowing things down to uh, uh, where uh, you might be using the StealthWatch product in your security controls and processes. And then Jameson and I will sort of uh, walk through our discussion um, and um, go through the standard sets of questions I use in these What Works interviews and, and papers. And as uh, we're going along, we'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions, but as we're going along, if you want to ask Jameson a question or me a question, just enter it into that question box on the right-hand side of your screen, and uh, we'll deal, try to deal with as many questions as possible right in the flow of our discussion. If you are watching a recorded version of this, um, at the end we'll give you an email address where you can send questions in questions in via email and we'll get you your responses that way. So with that, let's get started. So um, I always like to start off the new year sort of looking at the numbers from the last year. Um, there's a couple sources I, I found to be very reliable over the years and I keep looking back on. One of them is the Identity Theft Resource Center. Uh, you see some data from them up on the screen with the 2016 summary numbers. So last year, 2016, there were 980 documented public breaches in uh, globally. Now these are not just, um, these are just breaches. These are not all incidents, you know, for example, denial of service or even ransomware attacks did not necessarily get included in here, although there have been rulings here recently that ransomware attacks do count as uh, breaches. Um, for some uh, uh, a variety of uh, technical reasons, but 980 breaches happened in 2016, which is about a 15% increase from what we saw in 2015 from the same data, 781 in 2015. So from that metric, more breaches. But if you drill down a little bit more into the numbers and look at the total number of records that got exposed last year and divide by that number of breaches, the average breach was about 36,000 records. Where if you look at the 200, uh, 2015 data, the number was almost seven times bigger, 215,000 records per breach in 2015. Now some of that was due to there were a bigger number, the big you know, 26 million record type mega breaches last year, although we did have some big ones like Yahoo um, count against, this, uh, against the 2016 numbers. And last year there were a lot of smaller ones, state governments had particular uh, pieces of software that were attacked across uh, lots of states and small breaches that got replicated. But we also found that um, not only were some enterprises not on the list, if there were 980 breaches, 
over 9,000 companies in the Fortune 10,000 did not show up, but also ones that were in there uh, were doing some things to limit the size of breaches, essentially faster detection and faster remediation, meaning that perhaps a database being exfiltrated was stopped in process, or only one set of records got sent out, not uh, 10 different servers' um, uh, shares of records got sent out. So there were things being done right by people that limited the impact of these breaches and the cost, even if they still did uh, suffer the, the breach and, and have an incident. And invariably, when you look at the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, or in my years of dealing with clients, at uh, my years at Gartner before coming to SANS, or over the four years here at SANS, some common threads emerge, and certainly, better visibility uh, into what's going on on endpoints and on networks, turning that visibility into a better understanding of the overall inv threat environment, vulnerability environment, essentially what we call situation awareness, and turning that knowledge into action faster, more accurate action more quickly is the common thread between those who suffered huge breaches and uh, huge costs, those who either avoided the breaches or suffered uh, the same attack at a much lower cost to the business because of faster and more accurate security action. So that's the goal. Uh, essentially, uh, the whole What Works program we do at SANS is to try to find people doing things that are helping fight this battle of uh, decreasing the impact of security incidents. And um, you know, the reality is, in order to do this, it's not a one-time fight. It's trying to turn these things into continual processes um, and repeatable processes and hopefully look at uh, deploying security operation centers that can make uh, our security program both more effective and more efficient through repeatable processes and automation and force multipliers to help a limited staff do all these things. But, you know, the bottom line is uh, what you see here in the circle are sort of the standard steps we all understand. We, we know we have security policies, then we have to have a baseline. What are we trying to protect? What's on our network? What devices? What software? What's the configuration? What vulnerabilities do they have? Uh, what threats are out there? Assess the risk. Is something bad happening, starting to happen? How do we mitigate the vulnerabilities or shield them if we can't mitigate them? And how do we use that knowledge to sort of feed forward to eliminate the root cause and hopefully not suffer the same problem the next time a threat actor launches the same threat? Um, so on the inside are the sort of standard steps. On the outside are the typical security controls um, that we use. And over the years, SANS has been a big supporter of the critical security controls effort that's now um, under the shepherdship of the Center for Internet Security. And uh, you're probably, most of you out there, are familiar with the critical security controls. It's been recently upgraded to version 6, which you see on your screen. And they're sort of ordered in priority order, uh, the priority being what things, if the good guys did them, would stop the bad guys, asking pen testers and red team types, um, if, the, if the target had been doing these things, which would give you the most difficulty in breaking in? And when you look at the sort of top four, you see pretty much the standard baselining, knowing the inventory of devices and software out there and what secure configurations they should have and what vulnerabilities and so on. And it's really when you can achieve that basic level of visibility and control that you can then start moving up sort of up the food chain to be able to detect uh, deviations and anomaly and malicious behavior and, and advanced targeted attacks that are trying to take advantage of these vulnerabilities. Um, if you can't sort of eliminate the noise from that lowest level, it's very hard to uh, ever see these higher level attacks, let alone have the people resources to deal with them. So, you know, part of the goal is uh, what are the processes that uh, overcome the obstacles to uh, implementing the critical security controls and getting that level of visibility. Because none of these things are new security terms or security controls or security processes. Um, it's overcoming those obstacles to making them work and making them work within your business and your staffing constraints um, that separate, again, the ones who are on the breach list and the ones who are not on the breach list. And that's, again, the ones, uh, lessons we like to learn here from the What Works program. 
And I like to stress uh, it's that taking action part. You know, if you're just monitoring things, that's just security voyeurism. You know, it's great. I saw this data, and look, a bad thing happened to the business. Oh, look, another one. That's really not helping the business. So, you know, there's all, all kinds of sources of data in the business, and if you look at most large businesses today, they're taking advantage of a lot of customer data and calling it business intelligence services, and in the financial world, looking at transactions and trying to more qu quickly determine fraud and stop fraud earlier on. Uh, we have the same challenge in security. We have lots of data coming from the security controls themselves, firewalls, intrusion detection, web security gateways, email, um, all kinds of things spewing out security data, routers and uh, switches and servers and endpoint syslog and flow data and all kinds of great stuff, great data coming. And then we're starting to get more data from threat sources, whether it's simply indicators of compromise type signatures or hashes of known bad malware or uh, tactics and techniques that uh, we can use to be smarter when human analysts are looking at events on the network. Uh, with with those sort of analytics in place, we can start to find what's important in the data and get an understanding of the situation. Business as usual, threat hitting us that we're, is not going to cause impact because we're safe, threat hitting us that may cause damage because we do have a vulnerability there, threat that's only hitting us or only hitting our industry and not just a standard threat hitting everybody. Uh, all those situations determine different courses of action disconnect everything. It's a, a code red situation, disconnect, or uh, disconnect only this server, only those 10 PCs, different actions that can both stem the damage from the attack but minimize the damage to the business by the security actions. All too often the security solution is as bad a, as, if not worse, than the problem sometimes. So that's a, another goal is uh, act faster, act more surgically and reduce the damage to the business both from the threat and the security solution. So with that in mind, uh, over this past year or last year, 2016, Alan and Paller and I uh, did a series of, we called them CISO Hot Topic Sessions and uh, we asked CIS, CISOs what the top concerns were. One of them was reporting to the board of directors and what sort of information uh, made sense to collect from a security program to do the right things to improve security but also to communicate upwards how uh, improve improvements in security translated to improvements in the business. So this came from Steve Martino, who's the VP of InfoSec at Cisco. And uh, if you look at the red and blue curves, this is sort of a higher, higher level vulnerability metrics. They call them the universal security metrics that they report consistently on. The red curve is the percent of discovered vulnerabilities that are closed within the terms of the service level agreement for so many days on a PC, so many days on a server, and so on. Um, the blue curve is what percent of known vulnerabilities remain open over time. Um, and you can sort of see in the early uh, fiscal 12-13 that the amount staying open was close to 100% and the amount being closed within uh, the SLA was pretty low. They put in place a lot of security controls and processes and, and a global security operations center type teams and uh, managed to make those curves cross and you can see sort of how they report on those days. Now those are vulnerabilities metrics. Those are, we're less vulnerable because we're closing things, we're detecting things sooner and closing them faster. If you look way down at the bottom in the blue bar there, you see their goal, uh, another one they report on, is time to detect. So their goal is to detect any incident on the uh, Cisco infrastructure within 24 hours and to main, uh, mitigate, contain, return normal business operations within 36 hours. And they have another uh, set of metrics where they report on that. That's the translation. We reduce vulnerabilities. We put security controls in place that allow us to establish fairly aggressive time to detect and time to contain metrics. And that connects, that those metrics connect directly to reduce business damage. And that's what we measure on. That's how we guide what we do. And you see in a lot of areas there, Cisco reporting sort of the quantity metrics on the left there under defensive metrics, all kinds of huge numbers on transactions and alerts and flows and so on. It's not the quantity that's important. It's the action steps. It's the 
detecting something as an action, and from there, that action enabled us to um, contain it within that 36-hour or shorter time frame. If you look at some of the sort of industry-wide metrics you see uh, across, you know, small businesses, it might be 120 days time to detect and closer to a year to mitigate. In the SANS community, um, in the SANS Incident Response Survey from 2016, it was typically between two and seven days to detect and uh, two and four weeks to mitigate. And again, some of that mitigation depends on how fast you can patch things like servers and the like. But um, it's a broad range. Uh, the goal is the shorter the better, but we also need to say what are the most effective ways to reduce time to detect and time to contain, as well as um, increase the number of things we do prevent, but not just uh, blindly try everything. Uh, it's try the most important things first, get them integrated into repeatable processes, and then see what we have left in budget and personnel from there. So with that sort of setting the stage, I'm going to ask uh, Jameson to turn on his uh, microphone, and we'll sort of get going with our What Works interview. You there, Jameson? I'm here, John. Okay, great. So to get started, why don't you um, give us a little bit of idea about your background and your role at Erie Insurance? Sure. Uh, like John said, my name is Jameson Badaki. I'm an information security architect at Erie Insurance. I've been here for about five years now. Uh, my role really consists of setting the direction for information security for the company and you know, helping to ensure the business's future is done with security in mind. Uh, with that being said, I kind of dive a little deeper into the incident response and the monitoring and detection parts of our information security program. Uh, before Erie Insurance, I was a information security engineer at a Fortune 5, uh, 100 company for about five years. Uh, I was on the incident response team building a lot of the tools that the investigators used to go after uh, a lot of the bad things that were happening. All right, so let's see if uh, you're the information security architect, then do you report to a CISO? Uh, I, I, right now I'm in the enterprise architecture department, but the enterprise architecture department and the information security program report to the same senior vice president that is, has the uh, CISO function, so yes. Oh, okay. All right, um, so sort of my standard first question is what, since we are going to uh, talk about where you ultimately chose Cisco Stealth Watch, what sort of problems um, were you having or um, areas that you knew you needed to do something that started you looking at solutions like Stealth Watch? Sure. Yeah, so the biggest challenge we had was just our overall need to improve situational awareness on our network as a whole, uh, especially into our 25 remote branches that we have. So we had a lot of prior tool sets and a number of um, challenges arose from them. Some of them were we had multiple tools across many different systems that they produced a lot of detailed information, but you'd have to bounce between systems, look at a lot of manual logs. That gave us a lot of manual correlation that we had to do. Uh, we had a really limited uh, retention. So we were only talking about 7 to 14 days worth of uh, data to look back on. This would be logs, packet captures things like that, and we wanted to get at least six months' worth of data. And thankfully, you know, with uh, our implementation, we actually ended up getting closer to two years. Um, what else? We, we also have uh, really uh, slow, proactive alerts and alarms. We didn't really get the visibility as a whole because of the limited retention. And another big one was we didn't have any uh, user attribution to IP addresses, machines, things like that. Now, since you said you're on the enterprise architecture side, if, um, even though you're the security architect, were you looking just for security tools, or does Erie use the same tools across network operations and security operations? Are you using different tools, or how does that work? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So when I first started about five years ago, there was a, a, a much more siloed mentality, especially within information security and uh, network team. So that was one of my one of our main goals was to kind of really break down those walls and start working closely together because we knew we wanted to get NetFlow data and we knew the networking teams were the ones that did this. And also deploying Cisco ICE was another great collaborative effort that we did together. So really it, the recent collaboration kind of benefits both teams. We uh, are able to learn from each other and use each other's tools quite a bit. All right. Now, I'm really always interested in how you obtain fund funding for any of these initiatives. So, you know, you, you knew you were going out to look at products that were going to be deployed. Um, how did you get the budget? How did you convince management? Did you 
Was it part of a specific initiative, just part of standard architecture improvements, or how did you end up justifying uh, the, the budget you would need? It was, it was a little bit of everything, because um, you know we know we wanted to do the right, do, do the right thing, but we just wanted to make sure we did it in the right order. So we actually had numerous penetration tests. All of them had similar themes, like you need to improve on network segmentation, you need to improve on monitoring and, monitoring and detection capabilities. So as part of our overall strategy to kind of revamp the information security program, we actually began our journey with the uh, critical security controls. And at the time, it was version 5.1. So what we did was we actually created a self-assessment baseline uh, against the 20 controls, and um, so we got a good idea of where we wanted to, where we are, and where we wanted to go. So when it actually comes time to purchase new technology, we can actually evaluate that new technology against our baseline and ask ourselves the questions: How does this move our self-assessment sco scores, and is this something we really want to do? So this uh, diagram that you're sharing right now is a sample diagram with. A fictitious company and some fictitious data, but it's uh, pretty much it's the the templates that we use to present our results. Uh, so StealthWatch had a significant impact on the, on the, this particular year's improvements. Uh, to give you some context, uh, from a, this is this assessment is done from the information security team's perspective. So this is our general baseline that we did, and once again, this is the, uh, the older version, uh, 5.1. So we had really significant improvements in control five and at the time that was malware defense that actually increased our scores by 21 percent and boundary defense control 13 was improved by 27 percent uh, some of the other scores that you know controls were control 14 the maintenance of audit logs that went up by 13 percent uh, control 18 which was incident response went up by seven and control 19 secured network engineering went up by 15. But if you take a look at this uh, diagram, you can see each control is listed. It's actually mapped to the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is another measure that we use. We'll get into that in a little bit. But um, as you can see, there's the given score, the percentage for each control, a trending arrow if you're going up, down, or staying the same. And believe it or not, we do rate ourselves a little lower after a year because we may have lost a functionality or gained a better insight into what we're doing. And the, the real way that we convinced uh, management is to pr present this information to them. If you look at the golden uh, triangles on control 5, 13, 14, 18, and 19, it will show the, uh, after we go through and do another self-assessment with the tool in place, where our perceived scores would be. So that was a kind of a, a big help for us. Um, and then if you progress the slides, we um, actually did the same thing for the NIST cybersecurity framework. But this time we wanted to do it with the enterprise view in mind. So we actually asked eight different areas to help us score all across all different business functionalities with the, the real goal that this could be a metric that we could be given at the board level to answer the question, how is the information security program doing? And it works pretty well because within about five to 10 minutes of education, uh, you can kind of explain the NIST cybersecurity framework really easy in the high level functions to pretty much anybody that doesn't have a, a solid background. So the same thing as last time, you got the levels of maturity that we're at based off of our scoring system. Uh, we have the perceived benefit from in including a new solution, and you know, as you can see, the StealthWatch solution really beefed up the detect functionality in these fictitious numbers. And most importantly, too, is you'll see at the bottom there's a two, two areas called major milestones and targeted objectives. So the major milestones is kind of a hey, here's what we did in the last reporting period. It's your chance to brag. And real important, it's to do that in non or to do that in business terms and use the don't use non-techno mumbo jumbo. Second of all, uh, targeted objectives is that's what am I going to do for you next year? So here's what we're going to do. And if I'm really lacking in, say, the detect functionality, you better expect to see some things for the detect in the targeted objectives. Now, did, did you have sort of that, I, I showed the Cisco sort of roll-up metrics of mean time to detect, mean time to restore. Did you have high-level ones like that? Uh, no, this was our first crack at uh, metrics and then, you know, kind of getting something that really spoke to not just tech, tech, technology-based people, but kind of across the board and across the business as well. Okay, so you, you had a good starting point. Uh, 
pen testing or external assessments that, that said you need better visibility and, and you're able to say we're going to improve in these areas. Walk us through how you went about looking at, you know, what sort of tools or controls or solutions could, could help you gain and, and how you ended up selecting StealthWatch. Yeah, sure. We, we basically made a list of criteria that was important to us. Um, we, you know, a lot of that criteria was some of those challenges that I spoke of earlier. We looked at some of the vendors in the space, attended various webinars for them to get an, a, a basic idea of the vendor's capabilities. From there, we narrowed it down to a couple vendors and brought in a, a, a select few of them. And we actually conducted some POCs within our lab environment and also in the vendor's lab environment, particularly StealthWatch. Uh, we utilized their lab to, to review some newer technologies as well to make sure it worked. Now, um, were, you, were you or the network ops side already looking at flows and using NetFlow, or was that sort of new to everything? Uh, we were in a very limited basis. It was very, uh, you know, kind of point in time and very specific areas. We didn't have that that big overall holistic view with getting NetFlow. Okay. Um, you mentioned you went to some proof of concept and bake off. How many different companies did you compare, and, and how did that go? Uh, realistically, we compared two companies and some open source tools. Uh, we quickly eliminated uh, the open source tools based off of some of our requirements and the need to maintain things and um, <clears throat> you know kind of fully baked out our solution with the stealth watch and, and the lab because what we were doing was we we're actually using Gigamon to create NetFlow. Uh, well first of all use Gigamon to span everything together, dedupe traffic, create NetFlow and then send it off to the uh, stealth watch collector. And that was something new for Gigamon at the time. So we really wanted to test it out and make sure that it works. So we were one of the first customers to use that functionality uh, as a whole. As well as um, we had a secondary firewall vendor that we really pushed to uh, kind of get the NAT stitching that the Cisco ASAs provide from NetFlow. And we kind of pushed them to get that into our code release. And we wanted to test that out as well and got some feedback to them of, hey, this isn't working great or this is working and here's how we tweak it. So it's probably a good time to ask, uh, what is the time frame we're talking about here, that, uh, you know, what year? Uh, this was, we started about two years ago, um, and it, it was pretty quick, you know, kind of getting all the contracts in place was probably, like anything, the, the longest period. Um, but then, you know, once we actually got it up and running and got everything tested, it only took a couple weeks to get it up and running. Uh, you know, basic, it's pretty basic, uh, create the flows point the flows to the collector, and then start ingesting them. So it was, it was pretty, pretty, pretty quick. Okay. Um, you mentioned you, you compared the, when you were comparing the, the two or three solutions, you had some criteria. What were the top two or three criteria you used? Um, I think the biggest one for us was uh, scalability and compatibility with other tools. Also, kind of, you know, as I mentioned before, we have a, quite a few other tools to integrate with, such as our SIM, uh, Gigamon, like I mentioned, our IP address management, and then Cisco Solutions as well was another big one, was to get some benefit from Cisco ICE, the Cisco ASA firewalls, specifically that NAT stitching that we make use of quite a bit, um, and even our secondary firewalls to get some of that NAT stitching in there as well. Okay, um, let's try and give everybody an idea architecturally. Let me bring up that... Uh of your architecture diagram here, sort of. Can you sort of walk through the, the placement of where you had Gigamon feeding, StealthWatch, and all that? Yeah, sure. So basically, we're, we're getting flows and creating flows from the Gigamon infrastructure, which is pretty much our whole network, including our branches. Uh, we're also getting some NetFlow from firewalls. That is being passed along to the flow collector. And we're also making use of the flow sensor uh, which adds a little bit of extra data to outbound traffic. So say you have traffic going over port 80, it can tell you what exactly the traffic is. So that helps us out quite a bit. Uh, we're also making use of the, uh, threat, uh, the slick threat feed, the Cisco lab or the StealthWatch labs threat feed. And that's being populated into the uh, SMC, uh, the, the management console, uh, throwing in ICE information for that user attribution. We're uh, making use of the a integration device that hosts the uh, StealthWatch APIs that goes out and actually pulls a, a lot of the our IP address management information 
it also pulls a lot of our threat feeds and extracts some of the, the data out of our uh, threat sharing feeds, such as FSISAC, and also integrating that with our SIM by, you know, sending flows and getting flows as needed. Okay. Um, since you mentioned scalability, it was one of your top criteria. What sort of number of, uh, you know, servers, devices, network segments, whatever, give us an idea of the scale you're talking about here. Sure. Um, so Erie Insurance is an older company. We've been around for about 90 years. Uh, we have about 5,000 employees, uh, mostly in the home office, but like I said, we also have 25 branch locations. Uh, we also have a unique situation where we have 18,000 independent agents and support staff. While they're not really on our network, they do interact with our systems and they're not our employees, so we have to kind of watch them and treat them a little different. Um, but what we're doing is in our medium-sized environment, medium to large, uh, we're getting about 20,000 flows per second. That consists of all the traffic on the network, the workstations to DMZ, the data center communication to our DMZs, our data center to our workstation, um, and of course, workstation is the external and any external traffic coming in. All right, so looking at the diagram, let me understand the, the sort of architecture of uh, StealthWatch. There's looks like there's flow sensors, then collectors, and then a management console. Those are the three different StealthWatch products you deployed? Yeah, but I kind of look at it as we really have five parts. Like we said, the management console, that's kind of the brains of where our analysts go and ask the questions of all the data. The collector is where all the flows are going into the database, being deduped and being stored for the, and giving us that retention that we need. Flow sensors are kind of giving us some more of that information on things going outbound. And like I said, the fourth part is the uh, slick threat feed. That's kind of the threat feed that StealthWatch puts together and populates our data in real time. And lastly is the that Landcope integration appliance that kind of goes and integrates with a lot of our other tools, uh, gives us the API calls into the SIM, uh, our IP address management to populate host groups so we can have a real up-to-date daily view of our inventory, which is kind of, you know, you know, items, you know, one and, you know, the first function of both the critical security controls and the NIST cybersecurity framework, as well as kind of populating some of our, getting some of our threat feed information and populating that on a, you know, very up-to-date basis. Okay, we had a question. Are you using devices on TAPS or SPAN ports as well? Um, pretty much just SPAN ports. Okay. And that's, the Gigamon's really helping us out with that. Okay. And then, um, Let's see, maybe a lot of people may not understand the Cisco Identity Service Engine, Cisco ICE. Can you explain what, how that sort of feeds in? Yeah, so the, the, the Cisco ICE kind of really gives uh, uh, user attribution. So within Landcope uh, StealthWatch, we basically have here's a flow, here's an IP address talking to another IP address. From the internal side of things, we're making use of certs and we're pulling out usernames and, and sticking that to the IP address. So I can actually search in StealthWatch for a user or uh, an IP or a MAC address because Cisco ICE is giving us that attribution. So we're not just seeing, you know, IP address A is talking to the outside. We're seeing Joe Smith is talking to the outside. We're seeing Joe Smith's Apple device is talking to the outside. So it really helps us out quite a bit. Okay, so how how is StealthWatch used? Is there some, you as the architect or somebody in security operations that sort of sits down at the console and leans forward and digs through things, or there's alerts that happen, or walk us through how, operationally, how it works? Yeah, so, um, you know, I learned this at my previous, previous employer quite a bit, uh, some really helpful information. Um, because StealthWatch gives you just a sheer amount of information, and in order to make any sense of that, you really have to ask yourself four main questions. They are simply, what are our threats? What do we want to monitor? What can this do for my company? What, so what can this do for your insurance? Um, and then how do, most importantly, how does the InfoSec team respond? Because like you said, we can just get alerts and see them and kind of just watch it, or we can actually respond to it, and that's the ideal situation, is you want to stop, respond and stop to these. So. When I say what are our threats, basically we understand our threats in many ways. We use risk, assess risk assessments as well as you know various forms of threat intelligence. 
like I said, the slick threat feed from StealthWatch himself, information sharing groups like FSISAC. We create our own intelligence from our previous incidents that we have, and we also utilize a lot of open source intelligence. Never underestimate that. The power of Twitter is pretty, uh, pretty amazing for some of those things. Uh, the second question is what do we want to monitor? We really wanted to base this off of what does the business think is important. So we wanted to utilize our internal business impact analysis reports, find out what really makes your insurance money, uh, bubble those up to be some of the more important things. Uh, we also monitor off existing policies, uh, any assets that we deem risky, things that have direct internet presence, and of course anything with compliance or regulations. Um, question three is what can this do for your insurance? We really kind of point back to that being measuring ourselves. Those are those self-assessments that we showed. So the critical security controls in the NIST cybersecurity framework. The last and fourth question, the most important one, is how do we respond? This is another topic that I got from my previous employer. It's the use of playbooks. They're really outlines on how to handle an incident. So we have playbooks for known alerts. So if we see these type of things, how do we respond? And we also have preemptive playbooks that we kind of go go through and go through the network and look for certain you know uh, bad things that are happening. Uh, playbooks are always evolving, and it really kind of helps uh, kind of bring a little bit of science to the art form that incident response is. All right. Since you said uh, you have a security information event management or a SIM product in here, is it? alerts from the SIM that are triggering an analysis to dig in through the StealthWatch management console? Is it alerts from your use of StealthWatch and, and things it sees and flows uh, that trigger alerts? And, or how does that work? It's a little bit of both. So we do get some direct alerts from Landcope via uh, you know, emails to our distribution lists and whatnot. But pretty every alert is being sent to our SIM as well. And we can always go from our SIM and grab flow data from uh, StealthWatch as well. So it's really a little bit of both. So if we're looking at an incident from the past, we can actually go back and look and see, hey, were there any alarms from Landcope? And hey, let me grab the flows that happened during that time period. OK, since you mentioned the past data, this is one of my favorite topics. If there there is an alert of some Oh, some threat that went active now, or, or, or you now have some uh, new destination that you now know is malicious. Are you able to sort of go backwards through the data and say, let's see if anybody else did this before we knew this was something we should alert on? Yeah, and that, that was actually one of our main goals, too. Like I said, we wanted that retention. That We, we never had the retention uh, before. We had, you know, two weeks, three weeks at most. <clears throat> but now we have actually close to two years of retention, so we can go back and query a lot of that information to say, hey, was does any of our assets ever spoke to this you know, known bad device that was recently discovered? And we can go back in the past and look two years in the past. All right, and what, what sort of alerts come directly from StealthWatch and the flows? Is it uh, sort of volume type changes or this node never talked to that node before? What sort of alerts do you get directly from StealthWatch? Um, I, I kind of break it down into a couple like high-level topic alerts. So we have like you know obviously talking to known bad IP addresses, which we all know isn't that great of an indicator. But if you can get catch it early and bring that information in quickly from known trusted sources, it helps out. Um, so we have a lot of those. It's like X you know internal IP address talking to known bad IP address. Uh, we also have a lot of baseline ones too. So this you know over time we have a good idea of who's uh, what our user traffic is like. So for a simplified example would be, uh, say, a, a adjuster at your insurance typically you know, sends out a gig of data a day. But now all of a sudden, they're sending out 10 gigs of data a day. That's a little bit out of the norm, and it warrants a, an investigation. And it could signify some data exfiltration happening. Um, also, there's you know, some other ones like data hoarding, like prepping data. To, to exfiltrate it, that would happen before the exfiltration, as well as some things like you know even looking for like DLP and slow and low attacks to never before seen IP addresses on the network. So those are some those are some really basic high level ones. Okay, um, got a question then. With that long a data retention period, um, how long does do queries take? 
Uh, that depends. So after a certain period of time, we kind of drop off a lot of the the, uh, the more detailed data. So the queries can take uh, depending on how complex you make them. Um, you know, within within the next within the first couple of months, it's they're pretty quick, matter of minutes. Uh, if you start to get a little longer, it'll it'll take a little bit longer. So we're talking about maybe you know 30 minutes for a query at most. I've seen. So it, it's relatively quick compared to some of the other you know technologies I've seen. Okay, and the type of data being retained you're talking about is uh, flow and, and metadata kind of stuff, or it's packet captures and down to that level as well. Uh, it's it's flow and metadata. So who's talking to who for how long, what ports, what IP addresses. Uh, throw in some of the ICE data as well on our side of things. Okay, um, you sort of mentioned this earlier on, but let's uh, go through it again. So. You made the, the decision, you looked at a number of products, you made the decision, you chose StealthWatch. How long did it take you and how many people to sort of get to where you are now operation, using it operationally? Um, let's see. So, yeah, I'd say it's probably about, it's, it's, it's one full-time person, and it's uh, probably half of their time to admin it on a generous side, you know, kind of making updates, uh, you know, making enhancements as needed, adding more feeds, keeping on top of things, making sure the solution runs re really well. So that, that's kind of the model that we have. And then obviously the analysts, including myself, we, we use it on a daily basis for investigations and answering questions. And was there tuning you had to do as part of getting going, you know, thresholds of uh, before alerts should come or, or the, the typical, what type of tuning did you have to do? Uh, there's a little bit of tuning. There's a, there's kind of like a, a, a break-in period as well. So you have to uh, kind of get a good baseline going to figure out what it normal looks like and adjust that as needed. So, you know, a, t a great example would be, say we have a known business process that, you know, sends out a job every seven days and it's a decent sized job and it, it takes a while to figure that out and tune it out or, you know, make the appropriate configuration changes. So there there is a little bit of tuning, especially if you want to get valuable alarms and just not a lot of noise. Okay, we'll sort of transition to the lessons learned side of things. So, you know, based on what you know, to where you are today and what you know now, are there things you do differently or lessons learned you'd like to pass along to people who are thinking of proceeding along this path? Uh, I'd say find a solution that, you know, gives you some enterprise reuse. That's, it sounds very obvious but it's an easier sell to, to make a purchase if more than one team's using a tool. Um, you know, find a solution that will consolidate and complement your existing processes and tools. Uh, another big one that I've learned was make friends with your network team because they are the people that can help you out quite a bit, especially when you're trying to get flows from a certain device or anything like that. And another one would be make use of your self-assessments. You know, we do, you do self-assessments to find your gaps you know, use those to dictate what you need to work on next. And lastly, um, if a vendor comes to you and tries to sell you a product, ask them how they stand up against your framework of choice. Make them prove to you why you should buy the solution. We've done this numerous times with great success and acceptance on the vendor's part because they simply view it as an opportunity to take that info and present it in a white paper or a blog for some more marketing material. Okay, one uh, one problem I know a lot of people have run into trying to do this kind of thing is um, when you start looking at flows or the type of data you're getting, uh, you're getting a lot of PC names or IP addresses that aren't sort of easily human readable or uh, trying to tie everything together. There's duplications or things are with the same names and so on. Did you run into that kind of thing? Uh, a little bit, um, but you know our usernames aren't very uh, easily recognizable. Um, but, and, you know, IP addresses aren't very recognizable, uh, aside from the one, you know, you know, that's an internal IP address, <clears throat> but the Cisco ICE information kind of helping supply that really kind of, you know, pushes us in the right direction to say, hey, that's actually Joe Smith doing that, um, you know, that's his IP address at the time, and we can even take that information, that user ID, and that alert, and send it to our, our SIM, and then we can do LDAP queries against that to pull out, you know, their full name, their location, their, you know, their job position, you know, where they sit, things like that. Okay, um, had a question here. If you get an alert and it looks like a device is 
uh, exfiltrating more than its, its usual amount of data, how do you end up uh, determining if that's a false positive or not? Um, we kind of that kicks off our playbooks. So if we have a, a potential data exfiltration alarm go off, we kind of start to dig into that, uh, find out who it is talking to them, uh, start asking questions of the right people. So you know, kind of this is, goes back to making friends with your network team, make friends with your sysadmins as well to be like, hey, I see this user is doing this in this system. Is this a normal thing, or you know, are there any changes going on in the environment right now? So those are some of the really basic first steps, but then after that you can kind of then focus down into it if it is still suspicious, go and grab a full packet capture, look at the packets that they're sending and seeing what's actually going on. It's just, you know, start knocking things off in that playbook and then get down more granular as you go. Okay, we had a question here about uh, integrating with the uh, SIM products. Wh which SIM product are you using? Yeah, we're using, a, we're using Splunk. So we're using Splunk as our SIM, and uh, a lot of the integrations work re re really well. Okay. Um, particular question was about Alien Vault. We'll get the uh, Cisco Stealth Watch people to answer if it integrates with uh, Alien Vault. All right. Um, so you mentioned Cisco Ice, um, and you get that identity data. Cisco Ice often also used for, you know, like network access control functions and quarantining uh, unmanaged devices or unknown new devices. Are you doing that kind of thing? Uh, so right now we're kind of using a lot of the 802.1x features for, you know, making sure that our devices have certs <coughs> and they go on our network and how we handle BYOD devices. Um, we're also making use of device profiling features and some, starting some of the posture assessment. But our plan in the future is to uh, definitely make use of some of that automated response to if I see this, this person exfiltrating 10 gigs of data, I'm going to take them in ICE and boot them to a like a remediation slash quarantine subnet or VLAN, and then they, they can then we can get an alert, and then we can go in and prevent them from doing further activity, and then remediate their system if it's malware or whatever. So those are kind of the where we are now and where we're heading in the future with ICE. Okay, one standard question I always ask is about the vendor support. So as you were going through your deployment, did you use support from um, Cisco, Landcope, and um, how do you how do you rate their support? Uh, I'd say their support's very responsive. I know that over the past couple years, they've kind of really focused on this, getting better at customer support. They're like a lot of the people that get their our tickets. They're very uh, helpful and willing to answer your questions and get answers for you. We even had uh, some some you know some of the support people. Uh, you know, dial in with us during restrictive change windows after hours or on the weekends to make sure that things went well. Um, they also really kind of started pushing their uh, their community portal. So there's a lot of great knowledge base articles and contributions there and discussions where you can most times find your answer before you even have to call up support or submit a ticket. Another big one that we had was our onboarding process. So you know, we're a growing team and when new employees come on board, they have training within that uh, community portal that you can make use of right away, and we can put down our our you know first work employee, our first week of work employee, and say, hey, go through this training, start using the tool. Here's how it works. Um, and lastly, the kind of goes along with the support functionality is we're also participants in their beta program, and this kind of allows us to test new code or features uh, before we deploy them or even purchase them. All right, now, it occurs to me, since you said you've been, you started this a few years ago, you were probably using StealthWatch when it was Landcope before Cisco bought Landcope. That, that's often a uh, disruptive thing. Has, how's it been going from dealing directly with Landcope to dealing with Landcope as part of Cisco? Um, it, no problems at all, really. I and mean, I think they're working really well together. I'd say Cisco's letting Landcope do their own thing, and there hasn't been a real, I haven't seen a real disruption in service from a customer standpoint and, you know, getting service from people. Okay. Uh, we had a particular question come in here. What were the challenges you ran into in doing the NAT stitching? Um, so within the, uh, the Cisco ASA devices, it was already supported and it worked really well out of the box. Some of the challenges that we ran into is working with a, a secondary vendor to, you know, get them to 
uh, A, supply that code strand that they advertised for a while and put it into their product, and B, was to make sure that the, the two flows actually lined up correctly and they're, they weren't you know, adding extra or missing information. Okay. Um, let's say since you've been using the product for a while, you said you're on the, their beta program. Are there any sort of feature requests you've put in where you've said, hey, I'd really like to see this capability come out? Um, I'd say they're, they're, they're pretty good at staying up to date on a lot of integrations and things like that. The biggest thing that I, I would say is, you know, make sure that you stay kind of vendor agnostic and continue to work with many vendors like you have in the past. That's a lot of fear sometimes when companies get bought out is that they start to tilt only during a certain way. But uh, the biggest thing is just to try to make sure that you support many different things and you know make the environment work a lot better. Okay. Um, since you mentioned that we, we had the question about the queries and you are storing, how, uh, what's your retention period? How long are you storing data? Uh, we were we were shooting for 120 days, uh, but right now we're we're actually a little closer to two years based off of some of the database enhancements and things like that. So we have close to two years of retention now. And that's are are is that through other products or that that's all within StealthWatch? That's all. That's all flow data within StealthWatch. It's all stored in the collector and the database and the deduplication that happens there. Okay, and. Um, had a question here. Are these all all those components, collectors or sensor collector and management console? Those are physical devices or any of those you know software that can run on a virtual machine? Uh, I know that they off. I know we make use of some. Our management consoles are virtual. Our collector is physical, and our flow sensor is physical. Our flow sensor is physical, just based off of its positioning in our environment. Um, I pretty sure that they offer virtualized versions of all of those and but we've only made use of the uh, uh, SMC the management console and okay. actually the uh, the integration the integration uh, server as well so the it basically provides the APIs and the scripts that we utilize so that's virtualized as well okay we're nearing the end of our session I've got one more standard question I ask and uh, any other questions from the audience enter them in and I'll, I'll uh, ask them of Jameson here um, so you're you're at this level of usage today what are your plans for the future um, really kind of just keeping up with what we're doing you know ingest more intelligence feeds as we as we see utilizing the integration appliance um, another big one that we're going to be doing is kind of doing some uh, Automa automated integrations with our IR platform. So once we see have an event that gets triggered, if it's a high or even a medium, we can hit a button within our IR platform and it can go grab the flow data for that particular host in question for a set period of time. Um, another one would be, like I said, or alluded to earlier, kind of maturing our ICE deployment to make use of some of those quarantining features. Uh, and then lastly is kind of, you know, update our self-assessments. You know, that's a yearly thing that we do and kind of utilize the, the latest and greatest. So use uh, the new NIST cybersecurity framework that will be coming out 1.1 and the critical security controls uh, 6.1 to give us a little bit more finer detail and greater insight, as well as kind of mapping some of the recent New York Department of Financial Services regulations and those activities to the critical security controls and then this cybersecurity framework to give us another input field on, hey, these are some of the things we need to work on. So just another sliced view of, you know, how we plan our work. Okay. Uh Got a question here. It's probably a good one to end on. The question from uh, the audience was, we're finding it difficult to identify vendors that focus on security aspects in NetFlow. Most focus on network analysis, diagnostics, sort of the ops side. Can you shed light on how you uh, selected the candidate vendors and, and what you saw in sort of the security aspects of NetFlow? Yeah, um, I'd say I would agree. Uh, you know, NetFlow obviously started as kind of a networker's tool a network admins tool to you know see who my top talkers are and availability, but um, we the, one of the re main reasons we really liked StealthWatch was because it really had it felt like to me at least or maybe it's just because I was more interested in it uh, a, a more security slant to the company. They have a lot more um, security minded people working there, and a lot of the alarms that they are that they build out 
are security focused. They also have a lot of networking things too, and our network team makes use of a lot of that, especially from you know capacity planning and the traditional things like that. But I would say just really kind of ask the ask the right questions of your vendor of what what are you trying to do with this data? What are you trying to find? You know, they may try to sell you on hey, we do this, you know, top talker thing or something like that. And you're like, okay, that's great. But how, how can I find that, you know, there's uh, data exfiltration or data hoarding going on or things like that? Okay, you mentioned there's uh, stealth watch training type stuff. But what sort of, for, for somebody from the security side or the network side for that matter, to sit down and start using stealth watch, what sort of skills or background do they need to bring to the table? Is it more than basic network uh, understanding and basic network security knowledge? Um, I would say obviously it's you know kind of knowing how computers and networks work but the other big biggest thing too is know the network that you're working on so you're not going to be able to understand anything if you know hey you have to go through three different layers of firewalls and four DMZs and if you don't understand what's going on in each of those you're going to not get a good picture so I kind of go back to the make friends with your network team, utilize them to teach you how the network's built, and find out all those little tricks that they have put in and things like that, and kind of really work really closely with them. Because they're going to they're gonna know it better than you are, so. Okay, good stuff, and we're just about at the end of our uh, time period here. So I wanted to give a uh, slide with some URLs where people could get additional resources. There's the URL at the top for all the What Works um, studies SANS has done and the papers published. There's the Center for Internet Security URL for more of the latest information on the critical security controls. The next major SANS event that's sort of directly related to this area will be the SOC Summit in Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area. I think it's June of 2017. There's the link for that. More information on StealthWatch. If you are uh, listening to a recorded version of this uh, and you have some questions, or if uh, you were listening live and just didn't get your question in, you can set it to q at sans.org, and uh, we'll get the right person and get you the right answer back. And there's uh, my Twitter handle if you want to tweet at me. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carol for some final words. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jameson and John, for your great presentation, and to Cisco for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, you can visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care. And we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.